As I referenced a few minutes ago, uh, if you're new to Grace Church, welcome, and it's our practice to work through the Scriptures. We have been working our way for a number of months through the Gospel of Matthew. This is the record of Jesus of Nazareth's life, who was nothing less than the Son of God. He was no mere rabbi, no mere religious teacher, no mere sort of religious reformer. He was indeed God and the significance of what it was that he taught. And so Matthew records this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and we want to think of this today. As you think about people, there's often a discussion that comes up whenever you get into different conversations. It doesn't matter what the topic is. People want to know, who do you think is the greatest? Jordan or James? Who is the greatest? Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo? Plato or Aristotle? Jimi Hendrix or Jeff Beck? Aretha Franklin or Whitney Houston? Martin Luther or John Calvin? Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher? John Wesley or George Whitfield? Who is the greatest? And Depending on the report card you use, depending on the rubric you're using, you have your answer, and you're intending to convince others of us that your answer is, of course, right. Well, meanwhile, some of your friends might disagree with your answer, tell you why you're using the wrong report card, hand you their report card, and tell you why they think, obviously, Jeff Beck is greater than Jimi Hendrix. Obviously, Lionel Messi is better than Cristiano Ronaldo. I mean, it's sort of a no-brainer. I'm sort of insulted you even asked this question, but I will endure this moment, and I will teach you accordingly. We have these conversations all the time, and most of the times they're, they're quite fun. Sometimes they can become quite heated. I have to confess, sometimes I've enjoyed sitting back and watching people have these debates. It's BYOP, bring your own popcorn. This conversation, though, does not, it's not unique to politics. It's not unique to church history. It's not unique to sports or musicians. This conversation even finds its way in the pages of Scripture as this question is being asked. But it's not being asked to someone like you or I who have seemingly their own subjective report. This question is being asked by no one less than the Son of God Himself. As the disciples say, Jesus, who will be the greatest in your kingdom? Could you answer us for this now? Presumably a conversation already having taken place before they direct the question to Jesus. They want to know. And Jesus comes to this question with an answer, but he gives them more than simply what they're asking for. He teaches them more than simply what they think they need to learn. And it's often, as is the case with Jesus with his answers, not what they were initially looking for, but better than they could have ever imagined. So tonight, if you're taking notes, Jesus is going to teach us, number one, humility is the pathway to greatness. Number two, be careful to not cause Christians to sin. And number three, God cares about every single Christian, every single one. Our text is Matthew 18. Follow along if you've got a Bible. If you don't, you can just listen along and know that they're available to you after the service for free at the Welcome Center. We want you to feel like you've got those for you if you'd like one. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, first of all, teaches something quite disorienting to the disciples. Humility is the pathway to greatness. This past year, we saw in the United States another president placed into office. Having won the election in November, Joe Biden was then inaugurated as the president in January. 
And what we saw in the news is what we see every time there's a new president. doesn't matter whether it's our country or any other country. It's the same old question that begins to follow. It's, it's who is going to be the president's cabinet members? Who's going to be their secretary of finance? Who's going to be their secretary of housing? Who's, who's going to sit in these places? And they want to know. And quite honestly, what ends up happening is sometimes former contenders for the same office who are once debating each other on stage and like calling each other names. Oh yeah, well back in 86 you did this. Oh yeah, well back in 97 you said this. And they're like really just throwing jabs at each other so that they can win the primary nominee for their party. Then surprisingly, a few months later, they're all friends. And they begin to like pick amongst their friends who they want to sit in one place. And this is a great prestigious honor. They get picked, and sometimes people get picked, you're like, I have never thought about that person ever as having anything to do with housing, but it becomes an area of responsibility as a way to kind of recognize and sort of honor them accordingly, and so people vie for cabinet positions. The disciples, they want to know, Jesus, you've been talking about, and you continue to talk about the, the kingdom of heaven. As we've talked about extensively in the past, the kingdom of God, over 32 times in the book of Matthew, Jesus keeps talking about the kingdom of heaven. So like, hey, we get it. We're excited. Tell us who sits in the cabinet. We want to know. Jesus says, you want to know? Yeah, we want to know. All right, I'll teach you. And then to the surprise, he grabs a child and brings a child in the middle of this group of men to teach them about what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And he turns the rubric upside down. He turns the perspective upside down. And notice what Jesus says here, how he starts to answer. He brings this child and he says, truly, in verse 3, truly I say to you, it's this statement of emphasis, so he's getting their attention, like, Pay attention, listen very carefully what I'm about to teach you. And he says, unless you turn. Friends, this is worth stopping just right here and standing and staring at just these words. Jesus has a perspective on life that contradicts from what the rest of the world's perspective on life is. Jesus' perspective on life is that the way that you and I are going naturally, the way that you and I are going instinctively, the way that the world is sort of ushering us is not good enough. It is not the right direction. He says, unless you turn. In fact, this phrase is a phrase that gets used repeatedly throughout the Scripture that's referring to conversion. Unless you turn. It's, it's referencing Repentance. And Jesus is highlighting the reality that if you're interested in the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to recognize, first of all, you're going the wrong direction. You're, you're, you're headed in the wrong direction. And the reason this is important to point out is because some people perhaps here tonight are thinking, listen, honestly, things are going fairly well. A few points of disappointment and discouragement, a couple of times of despair, but you know what I'm kind of missing in my sort of portfolio of life? I could use some religion, specifically Jesus. I mean, Jesus has really affected my friends for the better. And Jesus' is teaching, from what little I know of it, seems quite impressive, if not sometimes confusing. And I feel like what I need is I need kind of a, I need to finish the profile of my life. I need to add Jesus. That's a common way people think of Christianity. Think of the teachings of Jesus. Is that It's an addition to what you already have and where you're already headed. And Jesus gives a different answer than the disciples were expecting and maybe you and I were expecting. He says, unless you turn, the direction you are heading instinctively and naturally is not the right direction. This is what Paul will later tell the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, speaking about their testimony. He says, how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. He speaks about this. Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Well, now here is Jesus himself 
teaching it here in Matthew 18. This is a 180. But then notice what Jesus says. You, it's only to turn. So you're not turning from. Look at what he says. He says, and become like children. Become like children. Jesus is basically saying, kind of using modern day church vernacular, okay guys, let's have Sunday school for adults. And our guest teacher will be a child. That's not a common Sunday school orientation, right? You typically think, let's gather all the children together. We'll bring an adult in the room and the adult will teach them. Jesus is like, we got enough adults here. Let's bring a child in the room and the child is going to be used as a lesson, as a way to teach a profound lesson here for these disciples. This is significant because Jesus takes his child and using him as an object lesson The group of men surrounding a child, the child must have looked insignificant, but that's Jesus' point. See, according to the law at that time, children had no rights. There's no claim that they can make, no standing that they could have for themselves. Jesus says, we have to become like this child. What he's teaching is what we understand just instinctively even today with young children, young infants, young toddlers, young children, and how they are, how they trust their parents completely, how they want their children to understand them and to listen to them. Children have to do this. We have to recognize what Jesus is teaching here is that a child completely trusts in the parent, believing they can't do anything for themselves. You ask a child, what do we have for dinner? A child's going to go, I don't know. Child, where are we going to go? I don't know. I mean, you pretty much ask a child anything, and they're like, I don't know. I mean, they may come up with like crazy answers, right? Like, you know, we're going to eat like, you know, alien unicorns. Oh, how adorable. That's obviously, it's a child. You expect nothing from them. You know, that's how this works. What happens normally when children grow up? Well, think about this in your own home. Some of you, a number of you are young adults. Your parents were looking forward to the day when they would stop having to tell you how to do everything. Some of your parents are still praying that day would come. But the idea when a child grows up is that the child begins to understand based on the example of the mom and the owner of the dad or the grandparents, depending on who raised them, of how to assess information, how to make decisions, and how to accordingly take responsibility for those decisions. And so overall, Parents, even with adult children, they want a close relationship with their children. They want to hear from them. They want to talk to them. They want to catch up with them. And they certainly don't mind in any way the child looking for some wisdom. But the last thing a parent wants with an adult child is a child to call the parent at every turn for every decision. Like, okay, I mean, are we, seriously, like how old are you now? Like, have I just like failed you as a parent or as a grandparent that you're still making this call? I don't, I don't know. Can you teach me how to turn on the remote? Can you teach me how to... Like, a child usually never asks that because children typically get technology pretty quickly. But so many questions. Why? Well, here is the exact opposite approach. Jesus is saying he is not commending adulthood. He's commending childhood when it comes to how we think about our relationship to God. This is why it's so counterintuitive to come into the kingdom of heaven. Everything seemingly has been pointing towards independence and maturity, and self-reliance. And Jesus is like, you got to turn from that, and you've got to come to God, and you have to become like a child. In fact, until you do, you can't even be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That's exactly what he's saying here in the text. That's exactly what he's teaching. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is significantly talking here, and the emphasis he's giving is on trust and humility. Do you trust God? And do you not trust yourself? You see that? You trust in God, but you don't trust yourself. It's how we view God and how we view ourselves. We are to become like children who trust our Heavenly Father. This means that His Word is the most important voice in our life. We are not looking first to the opinion of friends or to the example of the world or even to our own thoughts and imaginations and speculations. We're looking to the Word of God to have its loudest voice. This is a display of our childlike dependency. 
Friends, for those of you who are Christians, let's be honest. Sometimes we try to act mature by making decisions apart from the Word of God. And we've, we have veered off of the practice that we should have as the children of God. I mean, what he is commending here, as you can see in verse 4, he says, humble, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It has been said by many before that you are never more like Christ as when you are humble, and you are never more like Satan as when you are proud. Well, that's kind of ominous. Who do you want to be associated with and be connected to? Jesus himself in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, he humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, it says, in under Paul's writings. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Peter says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So Jesus, first of all, says humility is the pathway to greatness. Now, same conversation, same scene unfolding, but more lessons to learn here. Secondly, be careful to not cause Christians to sin. Be careful to not cause Christians to sin. Look back at our Bibles, Matthew 18, verses 5 through 7. Look at what it says. Whoever whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes." Jesus is keeping the lesson going here by continuing to talk about children as a metaphor for the Christian life, the significance of this. Now, just as a sidebar comment by way of encouragement to the parents of Grace Church or those of you who have friends who have children and maybe want to come to Grace Church and have your children be under our care in our children's ministry classes, we take children at Grace Church very seriously. We care not only that they have good, solid, biblical lessons being taught to them that are sound and right versus light and fluffy, but not accurate to the Bible. Even more importantly, at a human level, we care about their physical safety. Now, I don't mean just mean like we care about their safety, like we don't want them to like plug their fingers in electric outlets and not like, you know, poke themselves with pencils in the eyes. We care about their physical safety, that they might not in any way be harmed and always be in a protective environment. In fact, one of the organizations that we've supported as a church from the very beginning is an organization called the Evangelical Council of Abuse Prevention. And our children's ministry director, Karina, working with the stuff that's been put in place by some of the other leaders in our children's ministry before has established what we want to have here for our families, environments where no worker of our children volunteers in that capacity without having a background check where we recognize and understand that even that background check, we still want accountability when children are cared for. So children always have the presence of two adults with them. At no point should an adult be alone with the child and caring for the child. That should certainly be true. And other practices in place. Why? Because we care about children at Grace Church and are aware, sadly, as some people in this room can testify to, of the implications otherwise, who have been victims of abuse, physical or otherwise, not in the church context, but in other contexts, and how that can just have a multi-year-long effect. And we are very sensitive to that. You know who cares about his children? Even more? God. God takes very seriously the lives of every single one of his children. And he wants to make sure he speaks clearly and loudly about that in a way that both encourages us and sobers us. And how he is thinking through how lives are being handled. 
God has always been deeply concerned about the way his children are treated. He promises to nurture them, to provide for them. He warns those who would want to harm them. I want you to go all the way back in your mind to those of you familiar with the Bible, to the first book, Genesis, when he's having a conversation with a man that we meet named Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, when God first called out a nation for himself and said of Abraham and his descendants, quote, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. This is the prayer so often of the righteous. God, do you not care that your righteous are being mistreated, are being persecuted? And God says, I care and I promise I'm keeping account and I will deal with that righteously. God has always identified himself with his people. Later after his ascension, during a time of of Saul persecuting Christians, Jesus appeared to Saul on Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9, verse 4, and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, he wasn't persecuting Jesus. He's persecuting a bunch of people who said they're followers of Jesus. But Jesus so closely identified himself with his people. Well, that's why we have in the context here about receiving such a child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, I realize we're in Miami, it's 2021, like probably like 99% of the people in the room are like, millstone, what? Is that like, like a CrossFit exercise? What is a millstone? A millstone is a multiple hundred pound rock attached often to an animal or sometimes a water source by which grain would be ground up. And there are actually records of scenarios in Roman rule where people were actually literally attached to a rock of a millstone and thrown into the water and drowned, which is as bad as you can imagine. Jesus, in this context here, verses 6 and 7, says he takes the temptation of sin caused by others to be so serious, he gives us this extreme analogy, it'd be better for this to happen to them instead. Woe to the world, verse 7, for temptations to sin. Woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. Why? What's he talking about here? He's talking about, in Matthew chapter 15, three chapters earlier, Blind guides leading the blind into pits. People who are being led by people, the religious leaders, and this is a problem that would come up repeatedly in all of the New Testament epistles. Peter writing about it, James writing about it, Jude writing about it, Paul writing about it repeatedly about false teachers who would come into the church, give aberrant teaching that would be a distortion of and eventually heretical teaching of the church in order to lead people away into sin justifying their own life and their own way of thinking. And Jesus is saying, whoa. That, that, that term is not like, you know, like surfer term from California, like, whoa, like we're commending waves. That term is an old school, Old Testament prophet term, which means cursed. Cursed. But Jesus' concern is what that looks like in the life of Christians. Causing people to fall. Now, this is even sober-minded for us even to consider as Christians ourselves. Sometimes we can embarrassingly, sinfully be guilty of even causing each other to sin. This word that's being used here, that's translated in some of our Bibles to sin, uh, others of you might have a different term, uh, to stumble, is a translation of the word that's scandalizo. It's where we get this English word scandal. It literally means to cause someone to fall. It's like to come up to somebody from behind and push them to cause them to trip. They were doing fine until you came up and knocked them. Jesus says that's what's happening here with the decisions that people are making. Causing a Christian to sin, being responsible for leading them in that way is a huge offense against Christ as well as the Christian. Now why is this so significant? Can I remind you of the scene? What was the conversation the disciples were just having? Hey Jesus, who's the greatest? What's that conversation filled with? And the subsequent conversations that follow? Pride, envy, anger, jealousy. Jesus is talking to disciples who right now are in the midst of 
a very sin-filled conversation, and he's saying, basically putting the brakes on this thing, whoa, stop right there. Don't go any further. What does this look like today in our lives? Spouses who want their spouses to lie on their tax return. Coworkers who ask each other to cover for them by lying. Coaches who teach their players how to cheat when the refs aren't looking. Parents who teach their children how to lie about their age so they can get cheaper price at the restaurant. Boyfriends or girlfriends who tempt each other sexually and just tell them that we can ask God for forgiveness or don't worry about it, it's not that big of a deal. This is messing with someone's conscience, contrary to what the Word of God is teaching them in their conscience. Conscience is a gift from God to be informed by the Word of God to help the people of God know how to choose accordingly that would glorify God, not please men. How we decide accordingly. He now redirects the attention from others to now ourselves. Look at verse 8 and 9. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than for two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Jesus basically picks up on the word picture that he referenced earlier in Matthew chapter 5 when he's talking about the issue of lust and what's causing you lust. Jesus is like, listen, you need to be taking your sin very seriously and the temptation towards sin very seriously. I think the temptation for us as Christians today is to be kind of like, huh, Jesus died to pay for my sin. Or to tell other people, well, you know, Jesus loves you right where you are, no matter where you are. Both of those statements are true, but they're distorted in how they're applied and used to justify sin. It's true that Jesus loves you as an expression of that in so many profound ways. It's also true that Jesus accepts you where you are, but never intends to leave you where you are. He never intends you to sort of get comfortable sin. In fact, this is exactly the very thing that Paul is talking about in Romans. Romans chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. He is overwhelming them with the doctrine of grace. I mean, so overwhelming with grace, he can perceive the question in their mind, which is, well, if grace is that amazing, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul says, may it never be. You should take it very seriously. In the words of John Owen, You should be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Third thing now Jesus teaches is that God cares about every single Christian. Look at the text, verses 10 through 14. Same conversation, same child present, same men he's talking to. Verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, it's our practice at Grace Church, usually an average of once a month, usually the fourth or fifth Sunday of the month, that we have a Q&A time. Um, so we have kind of a shorter service in order to have time for Q&A, and that will be coming up uh, here soon. Um, but let me go ahead and just get to the Q&A that right now is in everybody's mind, if you just read what I read to you, which is what just happened there in verse 10. Um, does everybody have guardian angels? And you look at the text, right? So it says, uh, it's for I tell you that in heaven, their angels, wait, who are the there? The little ones, they have angels. They see that like, wait, what's happening? This is, what are we talking about? Do I have a guardian angel? Are they here right now? Or is it like staff break because we're at church and they kind of get off and they're like, you know, catching up? What's, who, who gets the angel? Do I get one? Do I get to name my angel? I'm going to name my angel. You can just see how the imagination runs wild here. 
let's talk about what's going on here in the text. It's continuing to talk about children as this lesson, this teaching, Jesus is speaking of angels in the most curious of ways. Let's briefly talk about what the Bible says about angels. Some of you being very new to this, so let me just summarize a few examples and make some connections back to the text to then get to the point of what Jesus is saying. First of all, angels do exist. They are created by God. Both angels committed to His glory and even angels who have fallen and rebelled against Him. The reason this is significant is because it speaks to the reality of what Jesus is talking about here repeatedly, which is in the supernatural world that does exist. We know that Jacob referred to an angel who had concern for him in Genesis 48, 16. We know that the book of Daniel seems to teach by some people's interpretation that each nation had or has an angel in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. In Revelation, we're introduced to the angels of churches in Revelation 1.20, and the question is, are the angels or the apostles representing these churches? We should remember that angels are said to have carried Lazarus to Abraham's bosom. Jesus taught this in Luke chapter 16, verse 22. And they're also to know that we, they're rejoicing over one sinner who repents and puts their faith in Christ, Luke chapter 15, verse 10. So angels are real, they are active, they are doing the work of God, and they're caring about the affairs of the people of God. Peter talks about even how they long to look into the things of what God has done in Christ. So, what we recognize is that certainly the angels to whom Jesus is referring to here are in heaven. He further says, they always see the face of my Father. This text is best understood that Jesus is speaking about here, not this idea of guarding, but that their situation before God, making God aware, not as if he needs God, angels to make them aware, but this idea of advocacy, of representation, Jesus is teaching that God in heaven is aware of the situation here on earth, even of the lowliest of people. Now, what's interesting about this parable that he gives of the lost sheep He gives this parable in Luke chapter 15 with a different point in mind. In Luke 15, he's talking about a person who is not a Christian in the context of evangelism. But here in Matthew 18, Jesus is talking about a person who is a Christian that has wandered from the people of God, wandered from the flock that God has for them. Not uncommon to see this be taught accordingly. So we have to ask the question, then what is Jesus wanting us to learn from this? Well, he's talking about wandering Christians. Wandering Christians. And it really is an introduction to what's going to come up next week for us in Matthew 18. So the context here is what's coming in verses 15 and 20 is the context of what do we do with each other? What do you do with me? What do I do with you? What do you do with each other when we sin? Because honestly, All Christians still sin, and some in their sin wander from the people of God. As we'll see next week in Matthew 18, verses 15 and 20, which is the same conversation Jesus is having, that's the connection of how this text makes sense. But he talks about here some important lessons. The lesson he wants to communicate is this idea of shepherds going after sheep in the same way that God goes after and pursues people who have wandered. Friends, we have known this from the earliest pages of Scripture. Genesis chapter 3. What did God do when Adam and Eve rebelled? Did He fold His arms and say, I told you so. She listened to me. My word was clear. My character is perfect. All of my blessings are good. You let me know when you're ready. No. God pursued Adam and went after him and he says, where are you? Throughout the page of Scripture, God has always been pursuing his people, bringing them back, loving them, at times disciplining them. As it says in Hebrews chapter 12, like a father who loves his child, disciplines his child, so God disciplines those who are his own 
bringing them back to the reality of their identity and their security that can only be found in Him. But He's connecting here this idea to our community. This idea of the flock and the expectation that these disciples should have, and even as we're about to see in the pages, that, in the verses that follow, the responsibility we have for each other. A couple months ago, I was driving to Jacksonville, and I was by myself, and the best route based on the, the map program was to take the turnpike as far north to this point by which the turnpike begins to sort of curve into central Florida. There's this exit you got to get off there where you get off right before that curve and you kind of basically take a side street over and you jump on 95. A lot of you know where I'm exactly I'm talking about. But I'm by myself. I'm jamming along, listening to a podcast. I'm just cranking along. I got to go. I'm getting up there to preach at a church. I'm pumped. It's going to be awesome until it's no longer awesome when I realize I have missed my turn. And you know in the turnpike, missing your turn can be costly and parts where there's not exits all the time. And I looked at my thing, and it just literally added 45 minutes to an hour to my destination. Man, what I wouldn't have given to have somebody with me to say, hey, we're about to miss our turn. You're about to miss it. I was by myself. Friends, this is what happens a lot of times in the Christian life. You're going through life by yourself. And God has given a clear map with a clear direction of how to get there. But go on your own way, not looking at the map, jamming along, feeling pretty good, you've missed the turn. But you're by yourself. And that turn costs you a lot of heartache and headache in your life. The good news is, is for those who are in Christ, God pursues and he brings back. And he often uses people and at times Providence. There was about a year and a half window of time in my life, dare I say even two years of time, as a professing Christian, at about age 20, I was not walking with the Lord. I was not where you are right now in church. I was not doing what a lot of you do, which is reading your Bibles. I was not keeping the company like a lot of you keep, which is Christian company. I was living in this world in South Florida. And Lord, pursuing me, basically through one providence after another, just spanking me, just spanking me. How long are we going to keep this up, Eric? He didn't talk like that, just to be clear. And finally, the last providential act was me getting hit by a car on a training ride. I was racing full-time for triathlons. I was on a training ride. That was my idol. That was what I lived for. And I got hit, and I'm laid out on the asphalt over in the west part of of South Florida here, over in Broward, and my back is burning, but they think that I have actually broken my back. I don't think my back is broken. I just think my back is burning. And I want to get up, and they won't let me get up. And they finally take me to the hospital and confirm what I suspected, which was I was fine. And basically at that point, I was like, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of trying to think I can actually do this better than God's Word has actually prescribed it for me. And I repented, and I said, God, please forgive me. Please forgive me for rebelling against what I know is right and good. And the first thing I did was go to church, where the people of God gather around the Word of God, desire to glorify God in light of the Son of God. Friends, some of you are here tonight perhaps just like that. This is your first time at church maybe in a long time. And I want to say, welcome home. Welcome home. You're in a gathering of a bunch of redeemed sinners who do not walk by perfection, but walk humbly in community to love each other and by God's grace at times to pursue each other. Why? Not just because we care, but because God cares. And by providence of bike crashes or by people like your college roommate who reaches out to you after years and says, what are you doing? You're being an idiot. And God uses that conversation to convict you, to bring you back to where you need to be walking in obedience. That's an extension of God's love for you. So the question we have to learn tonight is, what is it that God has taught you? Humility is the pathway to greatness. We should be careful to not cause Christians to sin. 
God cares about every single one of us who are Christians. That's the reality. Perhaps tonight you're here because you need to surrender your life. You need to turn to God from the life you've been pursuing, asking for forgiveness and putting your faith in Christ for the first time tonight. Others of you, perhaps as Christians, you need to be a better Christian friend to your other Christian friends and ask for the forgiveness by causing them to sin. You've caused others to stumble because of your own ungodliness, and you know that. That's bothering you even now tonight as you've heard the Word of God. And perhaps others of you, you can think of others who are your friends who profess to be Christians but have wandered. Perhaps God's calling you tonight to pick up that phone and call them, to reach out to them in a text and say, can we get together and talk and express the care of the love of God who pursues the people who run from Him, that they might have clarity on where they are in Christ if they're Christians, to come back home to a loving, heavenly Father.